y'all, welcome back. Today we're going through some question and answers that you all have asked me on Twitch and on Instagram about everything from periods to antidepressants and pregnancy and everything in between. If you're new here and you're not subscribed, I would love to have you hit that subscribe button if you want to. If you don't want to, that's fine. You can just watch the video, get the good information and, and be along your way. But you're gonna be sad because next week I'm gonna talk about something that's really important to you that you really wanna know. I don't know what it is. Um, and I don't know what's important. I promise that it is though. We're fun. Okay, let's answer some questions. Someone is talking about antidepressants in pregnancy, which is a great topic actually. Antidepressants in pregnancy and they're asking about safety. We have a whole bunch of antidepressants that we've got minimal data on. Unfortunately, like most medications, we just don't have a ton of data on most things in pregnancy, but there are options for treating depression during pregnancy. The most important part of this question that I always want people to hear is that one, I can't tell you what antidepressive medicine is going to work for you. And I also don't want you to stop your meds just because you had a positive pregnancy test. That is when it's incredibly important if you have not, if it's you know an unplanned pregnancy, you haven't met with your doctor to talk about the safety of your medications, to immediately get in and have a discussion with them. The worst thing you can do is immediately just go off all of your meds because that can lead to other problems. And if you're not okay, the pregnancy is not gonna be okay either. So we need to make sure first, you're okay. When you're okay, then we can talk about what's the safest med that works for you and what's the dose that works for you. We know that people who have depression, particularly who were being treated at the time of conception, if they go off their meds and aren't treated in pregnancy, they're at a much higher risk than someone who maintains their treatment throughout the pregnancy of having a serious depressive episode or worse outcome, and also of postpartum depression and being on the more serious end of that. So having depression at baseline increases your risk of postpartum depression as well, but going off your meds in pregnancy exacerbates that quite a bit. So I never want anybody to just stop their meds. This is something that we definitely should talk about. You should bring up with your doctor or whoever you're seeing, midwife or whoever, and see what their recommendation is. But Yes, there are safe meds that you can take in pregnancy. Is a period cramp basically the same thing as a contraction? This is a really great question. I actually really like this. And the answer is yeah, kind of, but on a much smaller scale. So the mechanism of why you have cramps when you're having a period is similar because the uterus is a muscle and that muscle tightening is what causes both period cramps and labor contractions. Now, with labor, it's a coordinated like pattern or it, we'd like it to be. And it's a little different with regards to the mechanism of what causes the cramping or pain or contraction of the uterus, but it is kind of the same thing on a lower scale. Someone's asking, does the birth control pill actually help with PCOS? I have a bunch of videos on PCOS and a lot of them go into more detail on the discussion of does PCOS, is a birth control pill actually gonna help it? And the answer is that with PCOS, what really you need is to address why somebody is coming in, okay? So sometimes people have PCOS and they just want a diagnosis and they're having cycles regularly enough that it's not dangerous for them and they don't really have any other symptoms they wanna treat and they just wanted to be told like what it is and that's fine. Those people don't need to be on hormones, but someone might come in with PCOS and they wanna address a symptom. That symptom could be, for example, I'm only having a period every six months. Well, that is dangerous in PCOS because if you're only having a period every six months and you don't have another reason for that, like you're not on a hormonal birth control pill, or you don't have an IUD, or you're not pregnant or breastfeeding or menopausal or what, whatever it might be. You're just not cycling very regularly. As that happens, the lining of this uterus gets thicker and thicker. And as that happens, you are progressively, the more time that goes by, at an increased risk for development of something called hyperplasia, which is basically just overgrowth of the uterine lining. And that can be problematic for a few reasons, one of them being that that can also progress to cancer over time, and that's a, a big deal. But also, it can make your periods really, really heavy when you do finally have a cycle. And I've seen people, you know, bleed so significantly they end up in the hospital needing blood transfusions, and that's a big deal. So in those people, does it 
fix PCOS? No, but if we put somebody on hormones that cause them to bleed on a regular basis, then you're preventing some of the more sinister outcomes that PCOS can have. If somebody comes in and their goal is, you know, I have PCOS, I wanna get pregnant. Well, then I'm not gonna put that person on a hormonal birth control. So it really depends on why is this person sitting in front of me today? What is the goal of their care that they're seeking? And that's always how I kind of start out my discussion about PCOS and treatment options when I have somebody coming in to see me for that. And why does progesterone cause withdrawal bleeding? All right, so progesterone and withdrawal bleeds. Let's talk about it. So if you look here, this is basically the days of the menstrual cycle. So your cycle, it starts on cycle day one is your first day of bleeding and it goes all the way through. And then the last day of the cycle is the day before your next period. So if you look here and menstruation happens and period happens in these first one to seven days for average person. And then in this half of the cycle, here's ovulation. In the half of the cycle before ovulation happens, Primarily what's going on is your body is increasing the amount of estrogen that it's making and that estrogen is doing exactly what it does in PCOS, but we don't want it to do quite to that degree. It's making the uterine lining thicken up. And that's just to give a nice little home to an embryo if an embryo gets made. And then you have some hormones that cause ovulation. And this is not a detailed depiction of the menstrual cycle. I have a whole video on that if you want to go learn about it. So I'm not going to get into all of that. But then ovulation occurs. And then the next half of the cycle, estrogen is higher than it probably is during menstruation, but it's lower than it was when you were building that uterine lining. And the predominant, what is the word I'm looking for? The predominant hormone, oh my gosh, my brain just like, like no brain power for a three seconds. Progesterone, a hormone, is higher and is kind of the predominant hormone during the second part of that cycle. So you see that here. Well, the progesterone is being made from something called a corpus luteum cyst. And that's basically where you ovulate on your ovary becomes a cyst. And that cyst is a functional cyst, meaning it makes something. It makes progestin progesterone. And then it has a very specific lifespan of about two weeks and then it dies unless you have an embryo implanted and then it doesn't die. I can explain that at some point. When it dies, it stops making progesterone and that progesterone plummets. So it's not actually progesterone that causes a withdrawal bleed. It is the drop of that progesterone and the body withdrawing to the lack of progesterone. Progesterone is progestational. It actually keeps you from bleeding. But when that drops off after the corpus luteum dies, you have a period. Does that make sense? What causes it to become a cyst and produce progesterone? Ovulation. Where the egg comes out of the ovary is now in corpus luteum progesterone producing cyst. There's interestingly two questions about uh, periods and breastfeeding. So I will talk about that just briefly. So someone wants to know why, if they're exclusively breastfeeding, they now have a period at four months postpartum. And someone else wants to know if it's normal that they don't have a period at 17 months postpartum and they're still breastfeeding in the evening and at night. And the answer to this is it is just individual to each person. On average, most people, at least for the first six months, will have no cycles while they are exclusively breastfeeding. This is called lactational amenorrhea. It's kind of our body's way of naturally spacing out pregnancies because breastfeeding tends to inhibit ovulation. Now don't go using breastfeeding for your birth control. I also have a video on that. Sometimes it's okay too, but you should watch that video first. And so it depends on, most people will be six months a lot of people will be 12 months if they're still breastfeeding. But the variation in that is wide. Some people have periods throughout the entire time that they're breastfeeding, even if their baby has never had any formula or pacifier or even a bottle, they're just exclusively nursing, you can still have a period. It's just your body is really good at ovulating. And some people, it just takes a lot longer to go back to normal cycles and their progesterone levels are at a level where you're not going into cyclic creation of an ovulation spot and ovulating. So the answer to that is I can't tell you exactly why. It's just every individual reacts differently to hormones and it can be normal. And I'm sorry that you're unlucky because I personally would have been pissed if I was working that hard to breastfeed a baby and I did not at least get the benefit of not having my period. If the corpus luteum doesn't make more progesterone in response to HCG, is that a cause for repeated early pregnancy loss? That's a good question. So what this person's asking is, because I kind of alluded to earlier, sometimes the corpus luteum doesn't die at 
14 days, it stays. And the reason for that is that when an embryo implants, it creates, you know what it creates because you pee on pregnancy test sticks. It creates HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin, which is what comes out in the urine to test for, for a pregnancy test. That HCG also has a function of going back in the bloodstream to, to the ovary, to the corpus luteum cyst on the ovary and saying like, hey, excuse me, please don't die. We need your progesterone because yay, embryo, progestational, please keep making it. And it tells it not to die. So if that doesn't happen, could that cause early pregnancy loss? Yes, but there isn't really like a mechanism we know of that that's been like identified. So physiologically, if that didn't happen, would it cause the pregnancy to end? Yes. However, there's never been any real good science that's shown that that's something that happens. So we have data on progesterone levels and miscarriage, but the overarching theme is that we aren't really sure if a pregnancy starts failing and the progesterone drops because of that, or the progesterone starts dropping and that causes a pregnancy to fail. It's pretty well impossible at this point with the data to tell the difference in which of those is happening. Does that make sense? I identify as asexual. I'm not sexually active. I don't want to have children. I always say that I want to eat the uterus, especially when I get my period. But since in my case, it's not medically necessary, would there be any significant long-term setbacks to having that procedure? Probably not is the answer. But that being said, hysterectomy is a really big surgery. And I know we talk about it just like we do C-sections, like it's not because it's really common procedure, but it is a big procedure. So I personally, if someone was in my office with this story, would discuss the fact that the benefit of that is just that you now no longer have periods, which I get it. That would be very convenient for me as well. But the downside is that you have surgical risk. There is some risk to ovarian function with hysterectomy, not super high, but it can be impacted and it's fairly unnecessary. So I wouldn't love the idea of doing that just for that reason. But as with all things, this is a discussion that you should be having with a healthcare provider. And I'm sure that there would be scenarios where I felt like that made sense, but it's hard to recommend a major surgery that's not meant to fix a serious problem. Despite my husband planning a vasectomy after I deliver our next child, I was considering a tubal ligation. That's a complicated question too, because there's a lot of factors that go into like talking people through this. If somebody is having a baby and they're having a baby by a C-section and they want their tubes removed and they are sure that they're done with building their family, then I would always say like, well, we're there and there's really not much downside to adding, removing the tubes at the time of C-section. A little bit of risk, a slightly longer operating time, like three minutes, but overall not, it doesn't change the recovery. It doesn't change much about the surgical risk and it helps you out by ensuring that you won't get pregnant. If you're also planning a vasectomy, should you overlap those and do both? Mm, that is a personal decision. So some people feel more comfortable with that because it's it's like two really effective forms of pregnancy prevention and they are very averse to having another pregnancy. Some people, you know, would just do just one or the other. Now, if that discussion is my husband or my partner is having a vasectomy, I am not going to be sleeping with anyone else, meaning that's my only pregnancy risk right there and he's getting rid of it. Should I have an additional surgery to get my tubes out on top of that? My answer to that would be probably not. I don't think the risk of a general anesthetic and a abdominal surgery, even though it's common and safe for the most part, it still has risks like all surgeries. I wouldn't recommend having an additional surgery just for that. But I also wouldn't ever tell someone no, absolutely not, because you know there's always ways that you can get pregnant. Yeah, like you can get a new partner or things can happen where a vasectomy wouldn't protect you. And I understand that as well. So that would be a discussion point about where we're at and why we're reasoning through making that decision. I got pregnant five years after my tubal ligation. It ended in miscarriage and my husband got a vasectomy to ensure it doesn't happen again. That's a situation where, you know, unique situation, right? Because at that point we're going, well, this tubal ligation has failed once. So we either need to do something else, take the tubes completely out if they've only been tied or figure out why that happened or <laughs> we need partner to manage the contraception. How on earth does an IUD placed during a C-section not fall out 100% of the time? Yeah, that, that it, I think that too, a lot of times when I put them in, uh, they don't and you do have a higher risk of expulsion than if you get it put in postpartum or just 
when you haven't been pregnant, but it's not as high as you would imagine. And it's super easy to put in. So it's not like a huge deal if it falls out, then you can just put it in again. The way we do it is when we do the C-section, have the uterus open and just put the IUD in at the top and then the strings eventually make their way out the cervix. The problem with it's going to be, and hear me when I say this, because I've had people get them removed and they didn't need them removed, is that the strings aren't cut short because we need them to get through the cervix. And that can't, like, like it's hard to do that from where we're at in the C-section. So they just migrate their way down as the uterus shrinks. They're going to be really long and annoying inside the vagina. You're going to need to go in and get an exam, have someone make sure the strings are there and trim them. Otherwise they will drive you, or if you have a partner who you have vaginal intercourse with, they will drive you nuts. Have you ever had to deal with a patient that had placenta percreta? Yes, many times. And it is not my favorite. When the placenta attaches to the lining of the uterus, it can grow basically invasive too far into the muscle of the uterus or in the case of a percreta through the actual uterus and into other things like the bladder or bowel sometimes. And it is really, really dangerous and can cause catastrophic hemorrhage. It's about my least favorite thing to see someone diagnosed with because it can be so scary. And what causes it, we, we don't know. Sometimes people can just get a abnormal placentation like a percreta in general, like they don't really have any risk factors, but the primary risk factor is going to be multiple C-sections and then the placenta implanting on the front near the C-section scar. They just have a way of growing into that scar and through it a little bit more easily than they would on a uterus that doesn't have any place in it that has had an incision before. It's not exclusive to people who have had C-sections, but if you have, every C-section that you've had increases the risk of the next placenta being an abnormal placentation. And if you have an anterior placenta, and especially if you have a placenta previa, which means it's covering the cervix, that plus the C-section, way escalates the risk. I have taken care of that and it can be it can be scary. Yeah, so Tiny Brit says, mine attached to my bladder and lost five liters of blood. And that is how these often go. And I'm so happy that you are, okay, that's very scary. Does it require a hysterectomy to treat? Yes, most of the time, the only way to treat an abnormal placentation is with a hysterectomy. There are some people starting to do more of treatment with methotrexate and things like that, but that's gonna be not only less common, but also a a bit less studied. So most of the time people end up having a hysterectomy in that scenario. Can you explain how a TOA develops? I had one and eventually lost that tube due to hydrosalpinks, but didn't have any STDs or normal things that cause it. Yeah, TOAs are interesting. So we're kind of taught in med school and um, maybe not as much residency, but definitely med school that TOAs, which is tubo ovarian abscess, basically your tube gets an abscess in it and it is extremely painful and not an enjoyable experience at all. It can also be very dangerous it gets an infection. And we're kind of taught that those come from STIs that move up into the reproductive tract. So if a, you know, if an STI is kind of living in the vagina and cervix, and then it moves up into the uterus and then into the tube, it can cause an abscess to form in the tube. But that's not, not even close to the only way that those can form. The vaginal canal is a whole microbiome and any one of those flora that is meant to be there and many of them that are just found on the skin in general, like E. coli can be around there. Anything that can be there, any bacteria that can be there can move up in the general tract, especially if the there's an imbalance in the microbiome and something is growing more than it should. And so just like those things can move into the bladder and cause cystitis or a urinary tract infection, and then that can move into the kidneys and cause pyelonephritis or a kidney infection, it can move into the uterus and tubes and cause a tube ovarian abscess. So while a lot of them are caused by STIs, a lot of them also are not. TOAs are not super common, I wouldn't say. Not like you would imagine the UTI is really common. Most people have had one at some point, but TOA is probably one of the more common things I take care of acutely as a gynecologist. So it's always difficult to say like if something is common or not common, because to me it's common, I see it all the time. But in the general population, I would say it's probably fairly unusual to get PID or a TOA. Right, okay, I have to go get my kids from school shortly. So thank you all for joining the stream. <laughs> My team is going to be real mad at me because I forgot to record it without the chat. So hey chat, say hello to YouTube because somebody didn't record it. So whoops. <laughs>